Now, as I had announced on the first week of the year, our focus for 2020 will be on the return of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. In fact, we have this focus since August last year when we began the Omega series. The Omega series has proven to be very popular. I think it's the most popular series that I've preached in the last 13 years. I know that because people write to me, people that I don't know. I know that because visitors come, we are getting more visitors, and people ask me a lot of questions concerning it. Okay, so it's popular. It is popular for many reasons. One main reason is many Christians are discerning that Christ's return is just around the corner. It is soon, it is soon and very soon. And they are sensing in their spirit and they are feeling it. And the feel is so strong that sometimes it feels as if you can take a knife and cut through the air. It is so thick, the sense of it is so thick. Now, I think some of you can identify with what I'm saying. You're sensing and you're feeling the same thing. Okay, granted, not everybody, not everybody feel that way. But there are some of us that have been given the burden by the, by the Lord to, to, you know, to be talking about this whole issue about Christ's return. The sense of urgency is being pinned upon us in a very strong way. Now, these people are also looking at what's happening around the world in the last few years. I'm not just talking about the coronavirus crisis, but also numerous other things as well. The way things are developing and the speed of development catch these people's attention. They connect the dots to the biblical prophecies concerning the end times and their spiritual antenna begin to spring up in red alert. Now, for the whole year of 2022, I'm going to go through the book of Revelation. Frankly, I don't know whether I can finish uh, with the book of Revelation in one year. There are a lot of things there. Trust me, there are a lot, a lot of things there. And as I'm going through, I will also be learning a lot of things because many new developments are coming on stream. Many things are happening. Certain things that... <clears throat> certain things that... Uh, you, you don't you, 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 you don't quite connect with the word of with the biblical prophecies are beginning to happen right before our eyes. So what is going to happen that okay generally we're going to take one whole year or more to go through the book of Revelation. I'm going to go through it chapter by chapter okay uh, there are 22 chapters some chapters will take slightly longer time and then in between, I'm going to take short breaks to do the Omega series, not because it has been popular. Okay, I'm going to do the Omega series, uh, the 2022 editions, uh, one or two sermons at a time, not like five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten sermons at one go. But in between, I'm going to do one or two sermons uh, uh, in the Omega series. Now, I'm doing that because there are special interests and important topics regarding the end of this present age that are not specifically mentioned in the book of Revelation. Take today's sermon, for example, why I believe in the pre-tribulation rapture. The book of Revelation doesn't talk specifically about this topic of the rapture. Okay? Almost like nothing very clear, nothing very specific at all. It only alludes to it. But the rapture is a very important topic. It is important because it is one of the several significant milestones in God's redemptive plan. Yet, there is so much confusion regarding it. There is so little understanding regarding it. People are taking different positions. People have different opinions and sometimes they fight over the opinion concerning this mysterious event. Another topic that I would like to touch on in the Omega series is transhumanism. Some of you will be, whoa, pastor, you're going off the deep end. 
but for those of you who are clued in, you understand that this is a very important topic that is developing. Transhumanism is the idea that humans will, be your, will evolve beyond their current physical and mental limitations. With the incredible advancement in the fields of artificial intelligence and biotechnology, transhumanism, ladies and gentlemen, is no longer a figment of imagination and science fiction fantasy. It is now a reality. Believe it or not, this topic is discussed at a very high level, globally, okay, amongst the think tanks, amongst the global elites, okay, in different quarters. And if you are not already aware, we are standing in the cups of the fourth industrial revolution. Okay, it's a big word, but I'll talk about it when we come to when I talk about the, the, the uh, I mean, on the sermon on transhumanism, we are at a critical stage of transition from how the world will function to another stage. You know, we are only talking about, we are talking about the internet of things only recently. But now, we are already talking about the internet of bodies. Now, how many of you have heard about of these two terms? Okay, these are very significant terms. You got to begin to read. You got to begin to keep up with current affairs. Okay, Bible is important, but these things are very, very important because it affects it. It affects how we live in the last day. It affects what we can do and what we cannot, or what we should not do, or what we should be very careful about in the last days. The speed of development is not just phenomenal. It is accelerating. Human augmentation with AI and genetic engineering has become a reality. A new hybrid of cyborgs, human and machine, human and, 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 and genetic manipulation has, is emerging, is already emerging. Now, some of you, especially the younger people, I think you'll be excited by it. You'll be thrilled by this whole development. And you say, hey, Pastor, this is fun, okay? This is fun. You can imagine how gaming can be taken to a whole new level. You don't need your console anymore, okay? You'll be plugged in into the metaverse and you, by your movement, you know, by, wow, what do you think, even in the mind, you can control the avatars in the games. Okay, I'm, I'm learning all these languages in the last half a year. Okay, it's very, very challenging, but I know I got to keep up. Okay, young people, you understand what I am saying. So, there are many positives that can be harnessed from such technological advancement, especially in the areas of medicine and healthcare. However, at the same time, there are serious implications to consider, not just ethics and bioethics, but also theology, but also the understanding of our relationship with God. What does it mean to be human? That will be a fundamental question to ask. Are you still a human if your DNA is altered or you become digitally augmented in a significant way. I preach about a sermon on the hybrid race of the Nephilim in Genesis 6 in the Genesis series last year. It is an important sermon. Uh, many pastors shy away from it because it is considered controversial. This whole issue about Nephilim is considered controversial. Now, the important thing you've got to understand about that is the primary reason that God sent the flood to destroy the world is because he was trying to eradicate the genetically altered human race because of the angel and human hybrid. Okay, It is contaminating the world and as a result of that, uh, uh, 
uh, you can tell that this is Satan's plan so that the bloodline that will ultimately lead to Jesus Christ cannot happen. Understand that like this morning we broke bread and we drink of the cup. The blood of Jesus must be, a, must be human blood in order that it is efficacious, in order that we can be saved, we can be forgiven of our sins. Now given that, can cyborgs be safe? Can cyborgs be safe? Will a Christian who becomes a cyborg lose his salvation? I want to talk about this topic of transhumanism because it is so important. So you'll find that in the Omega, 20, Omega series 2022 edition. But I've been digressing. Okay, I digress quite a fair bit, okay? uh, which is not unusual, but not really in my sermon. Right? The leaders will understand when I speak to them during the leaders' meeting, I always digress. Uh, uh, but do you know this is a very spiritual thing? <laughs> I'm learning from the Apostle Paul. If you don't already know, the Apostle Paul always digress. That's why, you know, one of the important things about whether you can eat food offered to idols or offered to other gods, whether you can eat that or not, there's so much confusion in the church. And most of them say can. The reason is because Paul took three chapters to talk about that. He bring out the topic, he talk a little bit, and then he digress to talk about other things. Actually, he didn't really digress. But, you know, he bring in a lot of other things that people thought he digressed. And then finally, he said, actually, you cannot, you know. But then people begin to take that part of his digression and say, oh, Paul says it depends on the conscience and all that. So you see, I'm digressing again. So anyway, anyway, I'm learning from Apostle Paul, so you cannot fault me on that. <coughs> so for today, my dear brothers and sisters, I'm going to start the 2020 edition of the Omega series before I embark on the book of Revelation two Sundays later. The title of my sermon today is Why I Believe in Pre-Tribulation Rapture. And this is part one. There's a part two. I got to squeeze everything together. I thought I need to have a part three, but I think you'll be taking too long. And then this whole thing about the Revelation series will get pushed back more and more uh, to a future date. So I'm going to do it in two parts. Now I want to begin by telling you why I'm preaching this sermon today. This sermon called, Why I Believe in the Pre-Tribulation Rapture. There are three reasons. Reason number one, since I began the Omega series last year, I'm inundated with questions concerning the rapture, especially in regard to the timing of the rapture whether the rapture will happen at the beginning of the tribulation or before the tribulation rather or in the middle of the tribulation or at the end of the tribulation and as some of you know these are the three broad positions taken by christians concerning the rapture and tribulation so these three positions are, are namely pre-tribulation rapture mid-tribulation rapture and end uh, and, and post-tribulation rapture. I know in between there's a pre-rough rapture, something like a mid, uh, a version of a mid-tribulation rapture kind of thing. Now, almost all the questions come from visitors. Okay, we have been having quite a fair bit of visitors over the last couple of months. Almost all the questions come from visitors and those who watch online, they will write in in an email or they will contact me directly. They will befriend me in the Facebook and then messenger me. Uh, I don't know why our own people are not really asking. Maybe you, you understand my position and through all the sermons in the past, you get to understand why I take the pre-tribulation rapture I hope it's not just because you are I hope it's not because you are not interested. Okay? Anyhow, that's reason number one. Reason number two, though the rapture is frequently mentioned, it is seldom taught. Also, there are, there are different, different ideas about the timing of the rapture, when it will happen. So many Christians have different 
ideas, different opinions about it, and generally, they are confused. Most preachers, I want you to know, most preachers take a position, but they don't teach on the position that they hold. They don't normally do that because this whole rapture thing is considered a controversial topic. So they rather keep quiet on the matter. True, it is not exactly an easy topic to teach because the Bible does not clearly state the timing of the rapture. But that doesn't mean that the understanding of it is obscure. Okay, but that doesn't mean that the understanding of it is obscure. To me, it is very, very clear. I've been a student of prophecy, or rather I, I'm very interested in eschatology, in Bible pro biblical prophecies concerning the end of this present age for 40 years, okay, for almost as long as I am a believer in Jesus Christ. So to me, this is pretty clear. And reason number three, those who teach the pre-tribulation rapture position often got hammered by other preachers and Christians. Especially those who hold on to a post-tribulation rapture position. Now, I experienced that on a few occasions in the recent times. In a small group discussion, a pastor of a really sizable church was renting away at pre-tribers. Okay, pre-tribers mean people who hold on to a pre-tribulation rapture position. He was really renting away at, 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 at uh, the, the pre-tribers, almost shouting and gesturing, and he was really angry until I cannot take it anymore. So I interjected. By the way, I'm one of those nutcases. And then he quickly stopped because he knows that despite the fact that you know, our church is not that big, uh, he, doesn't, he doesn't want to trifle with me when it comes to a topic that I'm familiar, I'm, I'm familiar with. So he stopped talking after that. Now, I don't know exactly why. The post trebers some, not all, some post trebers get so worked up with pre trebers From my conversation with these people, they often say, the first thing that will come out from their mouth is this, what makes you think that we Christians don't have to suffer? What makes you think that we Christians don't have to suffer? You see, they see pre-tribulation rapture teaching as a form of escapism. Okay, trouble come, escape, and therefore a lot of people like to hold on to that position. And they contend that you will breed complacent Christians who will be you prepare for the rapture, for the return of Christ. The argument sounds very noble and logical, except that it has a fundamental flaw. What matters is not what we think about best for the believers. What really matters is what the Word of God says, what God thinks about this matter. It is frivolous to base an argument, any argument, this argument on our own conjecture, on our own opinion, on what we think is true, on what we think is best for believers. Now, if you want to read a more detailed treatment on my counter-argument, please check out an old pastoral reflection of mine, uh, written in 20th of May, 2020. Uh, the title of that reflection is Answering Two Common Criticisms of Pre-Tribulation Rapture. Uh, it is, by the way, it is enclosed in your bulletin today. So today you have two pastoral reflections, one a fresh one and one an old one. This is the one. You can also find it in our website under pastoral reflection. Now, let me give a short response. My short rep response to the question, what makes you think that Christians don't have to suffer is this. It is the wrong question to ask. It is the wrong question to ask. The rapture is an important event. Okay? It's an important event in God's redemptive calendar. As such, its purpose and hence its timing vis-a-vis -vis the tribulation is decided by God. It's decided by God. 
It's not decided by us. We can argue until the cow come home. It doesn't matter. God has already decreed when He's coming, Jesus is coming back to rapture His church. The important truth about the rapture, can we put that up? The important truth about the rapture is the tribulation is a time when God unleashes His wrath on the unrepentant world. It is a time of divine judgment. It is not meant for Christians. We got to get this fundamental truth very, very clearly. It is meant for unrepentant sinners. It is not meant for Christians. Now, I also want to address very briefly the accusation that pre-tribulation rapture encourages spiritual complacency among believers. Nothing can be further from the truth. Nothing can be further from the truth. First, the unknown timing of the rapture put Christians on their toes. Am I right? If I tell you uh, on this day, on this day, something bad is going to happen. So what will you do? When the date approaches, you prepare like mad, right? You do everything to prepare. However, I say, this thing will happen. It's imminent. It is coming very soon. You can't jong la. You will be feeling, have that sense of urgency. And then you'll be on your toes. Am I right to say that? And Jesus himself said that in Matthew 24, verse 43. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. So Jesus is saying exactly that. And the truth is, the truth is, we do not know exactly when Jesus is returning. And therefore, we have to be vigilant, we have to be alert, we have to be prepared at all times. Secondly, as you know by now, because I'm preaching this sermon, I believe in the pre-tribulation rapture position. But I am always telling people, people from this church and those of you who have been tuning in or, or, or watching uh, the Omega series know that I am always warning believers concerning the return of our Lord Jesus Christ until some people are sick and tired of it. And there are people who tell me, Pastor, why wow, you keep repeating that? Because it's important. And because I'm preaching the pre-tribulation rapture position, I repeatedly warn people about deception and spiritual complacency. I repeatedly warn people that the time leading to the rapture, the time leading to the return of our Lord will be dark, dystopian, and immensely challenging. I've even gone to the extent, if I remember, on two occasions, one time in an altar call, that we need to be prepared even to die. Not that I'm gung-ho, but looking at the scripture, anything can happen. You're beginning to see the world going in that direction, especially in liberal democracies in the West. Conspiracy theory, no, there's a conspiracy going on to establish the global government. So things are happening very fast. I believe that very soon, Christians will be persecuted, perhaps in a different way from what you see in the book of Acts. In some way, it will be the same. In some way, it will be different. But all the same, there will be persecution. Uh, people in this church will know that escapism is not in my vocabulary. If it is in my vocabulary, I think our church will have been larger. Uh, because, I mean, there are, seriously, there are people over the years that come, Pastor, I love your sermon, but every week, you're going to talk like that, nah? Wow, I cannot relax when they come for your Sunday service. But I say, hey, I'm preaching from the Bible while I'm taking passages, I'm quoting, I'm explaining. So, so what's the problem? Well, of course, I'm very more diplomatic la, than what I'm saying, how I'm saying it to you now. So, anyway, these are the three reasons why I'm preaching on this title today. Okay, I want to end my introduc introductory remark. Very long, right? But I think you're learning something, you're hearing my heart, you're understanding 
what's, what's happening, what's processing at the back of my mind. So I want to end my introductory remarks by stating, that my, by stating my stand on the pre-tribulation rapture position. I take, a, I take a strong stand. I take a very, very strong stand on this position. Why? Because I'm convinced and I'm fully persuaded that Jesus will return and he will rapture the church before the seven-year tribulation. I take a strong stand because... Can we, can we put it up? I take a strong stand because I've studied the topic in depth. I take a strong stand because it is the most fitting scenario. I take a strong stand because I look at the topic of rapture from broad perspectives. People that like to counter otherwise have only a one-track mind, quoted, will quote only a few verses. I take a broad perspective. I explore both the Old Testament and the New Testament. Yes, even in the Old Testament. I consider the ancient Jewish perspective or context both from the scripture and from the ancient Jewish practices. Pre-tribulation rapture, in my estimation, is the most logical and coherent conclusion one can arrive at considering what I have just said and using a literal approach to interpreting the relevant scriptural passages. You will know what I mean later. The mid-trip and the post-trip views have many gaps, many, many gaps. In my humble opinion, the arguments are not always cogent, the arguments are not always logical, and they are often incoherent. Okay, the word I'm using is incoherent. Besides, once one is forced to interpret many of their supporting passages using allegories. You know what is allegory? The passage say one thing, but you allegorize it. That means you look at it figuratively. Say, oh, it can mean this, it can mean that. Very dangerous to interpret the Bible that way. The moment you interpret that way, uh, you come to 10 person, 10 person will say that I have a different interpretation. This is my truth. This is my understanding of the word of God. Okay? So, people that hold on to especially the post trip spiritualize biblical passages unnecessarily. Now, I will leave my comments regarding these two other views as that. I rather highlight the merits, I rather highlight the rationale for the pre trip position than to run down these two other positions. Okay? But I gotta say that a little bit so that at least you understand that, hey, I'm a thinking person and I'm a spiritual person, but I also think and I think quite deeply and quite broadly about matters of significance. Now, though I take a strong stand on the pre-tribulation rapture position, please understand this. I am not dogmatic about that. I take a very strong stand, but I'm not dogmatic about that. I won't insist that I'm right and you are wrong. And because I'm the senior pastor of this church, hey, everybody take the pre-trip position. No, I won't do that. Okay? I can live with people with different opinion. This is not a hill that I am willing to die on. So I'm perfectly fine with anyone who takes a different position. Okay? So relax. Be happy. Although I'll come very strong in my re reasoning, but please relax. You see, on several occasions, I've told our church leaders that they can take whatever position, even some weird position, but try not to. Uh, positions in regard to the rapture vis-a-vis -vis the tribulation. Now, it is fine with me as long as they don't force it down on their community group members or other people in the church. You can, you can present your position and let people think about it, decide, and then choose. Now, here's another thing I want you to understand in regard to preaching on the end times. I have to stick to one position. I have to stick to one position to be 
coherent in all my teachings. I cannot one moment talk about pre-trip, you know, interpret the event to my liking from pre-trip position, the next sermon on mid-trip, and then another sermon on post-trip, and be happy because I please everyone. I can't do that. I will be incoherent. Okay, and you think that your pastor is stupid, you know, uh, moving from place to place. So let me give you an example. Post-tribers like to say that the 144,000 super evangelists that we read about in, in Revelation chapter 7 are Christians. They will say that this is the church. 144,000 spiritual, hyper-spiritual Christians from the church. But for pre-tribers like me, who take a very literal view in interpreting the scripture, we will say, no, these are the Jews. Okay, the reason is very simple, because it is specifically stated in quite a fair bit of detail that these 144,000 comprise of 12,000 from each tribe in Israel. Over a few, several verses, okay, we don't want to allegorize that. We don't want to spiritualize that. It is something literal. We want, don't want to turn it into something figurative in order to fit our position. Many people interpret the Word of God in that way. Why? Because they first hear about that teaching or they go to a certain theological seminary and they hold that position lock, stock and barrel. But people like me, I read very widely. I explore certain topics very deeply. And I'm not beholden to any school of thoughts. I'm only beholden to checking the facts, going back to my Bible, and see what the Holy Scripture says about it. Okay, now we can get started. We got two parts, so relax, we got time, okay? We got two parts. Why I believe in pre-tribulation rapture? You will not get simplistic answers from me. If you want to get something easily digestible, take it and happy, okay, pre-tribulation rapture, don't have to go through the tribulation. You're not going to get that from me. I will be comprehensive and detailed. I'll cover as much and as deeply as possible so that you have a good grasp as to why the pre-tribulation rapture position is the most biblically logical and coherent Feel. In other words, in Mandarin they say, <laughs> Okay, then when you want to disagree with me, at least you can disagree understanding where I'm coming from. Okay, so why do I believe in the pre-tribulation rapture position? The first reason, the church of Jesus Christ is not destined for wrath. The church of Jesus Christ is not destined for wrath. Put it another way. The church is not, God did not appoint the church, God did not appoint true and faithful believers to suffer His wrath, to suffer His fierce anger and fury during the tribulation period. It is important for us to understand one fundamental thing about the seven-year tribulation. Let's put it up. Let's put it up. It is important for us to understand one fundamental thing about the seven-year tribulation. This is a time of divine judgment. This is a time when God will unleash His wrath upon sinful and unrepentant humanity. Broadly speaking, there are three groups of people that will go through the tribulation. Okay, you can categorize all these other people other than faithful Christians into these three groups. All the sinful and unrepentant inhabitants of the earth who reject the grace offer, the grace and salvation offer of Jesus Christ. The nations that persecute Israel. The nations that persecute Israel, and you know that there are many. And the nation of Israel is also a judgment on the nation of Israel because the Jews have rejected their own. Messiah. They have rejected one of their very, very own. Read through the book of Revelation and some of the 
major and minor prophets, and you will see these three groups coming under severe judgment of God. The tribulation will be unprecedented in the scope, in the scale, and in the suffering, I mean, in the horror of suffering and destruction. Never before has the world witnessed such catastrophe and death within such a short period of time. Economic meltdown, hyperinflation, famine, wars, plagues, cosmic objects hitting the earth and creating major disasters and overt demonic manifestations or overt fallen angelic manifestations. Why? Why, are, why will all these things be happening? <coughs> During the tribulation period, because of God's wrath. Not because of Satan's wrath. I mean, Satan is angry as well with humanity, but primarily because of God's wrath. Look at how the prophet Zephaniah described the tribulation period in Zephaniah chapter 1 and verses 14 to 17. The great day of the Lord, and by the way, the great day, every time you read in the Old Testament, the great day, okay, the day of the Lord can mean days of disasters, but usually it points to the tribulation period, especially here, you get the word, the great day. So the great day of the Lord is near, near and hastening fast. The sound of the day of the Lord is bitter. The mighty man cries aloud there. A day of wrath is that day. Okay, rough. The day, a day of rough is that day. A day of distress and anguish. A day of ruin and devastation. A day of darkness and gloom. A day of clouds and thick darkness. A day of trumpet blast and battle cry against the fortified cities and against the lofty battlement. I will bring distress on mankind. I will bring distress on mankind, saith the Lord. I will bring distress. Don't bring it, don't just blame it on the human. Don't just blame it on Satan. The Lord says, I will be the one that is bringing distress on mankind so that they will walk like the blind because, because they have sinned against the Lord. This is the reason for God's wrath. This is the reason for God's judgment. Okay? And then continue on. Their blood shall be poured out like dust and their flesh like dung. Can you see that? The tribulation is a time of God's wrath and judgment because the inhabitants of the earth have sinned against the Lord. That period of wrath, that period of tribulation, where God unleashes His wrath and judgment, the reason for that is because they have sinned against the Lord. I'll develop this thing further. <clears throat> the tribulation period, hence the tribulation period, has nothing to do with believers. God's judgment and wrath at that time is not directed at Christians. God's wrath is not directed at us. It is directed at the unrepentant and unredeemed humanity. We got to get this very, very clear. Otherwise, in interpreting scriptural passages about the end time, we'll run all over the place. The wrath of God, the judgment of God during the seven year tribulation is meant only for non believers, unrepentant and corrupt unbelievers. Okay, let me get even more specific. We look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 9 to 10. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for His Son from heaven. Okay, what does that tell you? This is about the return of Christ, whom He raised from the dead. Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. 
This is the Apostle Paul writing to the Thessalonians believers. The Apostle Paul wrote two letters to the Thessalonians. First and second Thessalonians. The main theme of both these letters centers on eschatology. And in this first letter that I am just, have just quoted from, okay, the context is about Christ's return and the rapture. Very specific, specific about Christ's return to rapture his church. That is a context. And it is in this context that Paul says to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. It is in this context that that phrase, that statement is mentioned. And in the context of the letter, in the context of the entire letter, the short letter of 1 Thessalonians, the wrath that is to come can only mean one thing, the tribulation, the judgment and the wrath of God in the tribulation. So Paul is essentially telling the Thessalonians, hey guys, you who have turned to God from idols to the true and living God, relax. Okay, be comforted. Know that Jesus delivers us from the wrath to come. Know that Jesus delivers us from the judgment of the tribulation. In other words, they don't have to go through the tribulations. Believers like you and I, we don't have to go through the tribulation. Later in the letter, Paul makes Paul mentioned about this again. And these two verses here is even clearer. Okay, I refer you to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, chapter 5, verses 9 and 10. For God has not destined us for wrath. Plain, simple. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that we are awake, whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with Him. Let me read that again, it's so important. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to what? To obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who had died for us. This is, this is what Paul says. And so besides the context of the entire chapter, there is an immediate context to this verse that we have just read. Okay, I want to give you some of the immediate context. We, 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 we scroll down, scroll up rather, a few verses in chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians, verses 15 to 18. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. That means, will not precede those who have died. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up. Will be hapazo. That is a Greek word. That in Latin and then subsequently in English is being translated as rapture. That's when we will be caught up. That's when we will be rapture. The word rapture is not found in, in, in the Bible. But this is where it comes from. Caught up. A rapture. Raptura in Latin that is being later translated to English as rapture. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up, will be raptured together with those who are dead in Christ in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. And therefore, encourage one another with this good news. If you've got to go through the tribulation, my dear friends, it is not good news. Paul is saying that, encourage one another with this good news here. Okay, then after this, Paul warns us to keep awake and be sober because the day of the Lord comes like a thief in the night. And only after all these things, Paul say, for God has not destined us for wrath, 
but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us. I'm going through this thing in a fair bit of detail to help you see the context so that we put things in perspective, what Christ is really saying. I don't just take a verse and then tell you that this is what it means. I give you the context and I explain to you that the wrath to come can mean nothing except the tribulation period. We cannot get any clearer than this. Although there is no one statement to say that there is a pre-tribulation rapture. But you cannot get any clearer than this. My dear brothers and sisters, we are not destined for wrath. Believers are not destined for wrath. And there is a reason why we are not destined for wrath. And Paul gave us a reason. Second part of the verse, we have obtained salvation through Jesus Christ who died for us. Because we have obtained salvation through Jesus Christ who died for us. You see, one of the works that Jesus accomplished on the cross of Calvary is this. He is the propitiation of our sins. Jim word, right? He is the propitiation of our sin. What does it mean? It simply means that Christ exalted all the wrath of God levered upon humanity when he was hanging on the cross. He bore the wrath of God on our behalf because we sin, we are condemned to be punished, we are condemned to die. The wrath of God is supposed to be unleashed on us, but Jesus become our Tang Jian Pai. You get what I mean? He took the wrath of God on our behalf. That's called propitiation. A lot of modern theologians even try to do away with that understanding. They say, oh, that would be too cruel of our Heavenly Father. But this is what it is. God is angry with sin. God is angry every day with sin. In as much as He's gracious and loving towards people because He wants to bring them into the kingdom of God. So my dear brothers and sisters, believers don't come under the wrath of God. Let's get this clear. Believers don't come under the wrath of God. We will be raptured before the tribulation begins. And so this is my first re the first reason why I believe in pre-tribulation rapture. Why do I believe in pre-tribulation rapture? The second reason, Jesus shelters his church from tribulation. Jesus shelters his church from tribulation. The promise, this promise is not stated clearly. Okay? It is stated cryptically. But once you perceive it, you understand that believers will be raptured before the tribulation begin. And so I'm going to go through this explanation in a rather long-winded way. Few people know that some of the redemptive narrative of the Gospels of John and Matthew are couched in the ancient Jewish wedding imagery and language. But this shouldn't be surprising to us. Okay, it shouldn't be surprising to us because it is a pattern found in the Old Testament and the New Testament. In the Old Testament, God is often portrayed as the husband and Israel as the wife. Whereas in the New Testament, Jesus is the bridegroom and the church the bride, isn't it? So this wedding imagery is always there. Okay, that, this part we can understand. But when languages are used that are associated with the ancient Jewish wedding, we get lost there. Okay, we modern readers, 2,000 years apart from, from, from uh, that time, we get, we get confused. So let me tell you very briefly about the ancient Jewish wedding, how they practice it. Now, there are two stages to the ancient Jewish wedding. The first stage is the betrothal. The second stage is the wedding itself. The betrothal is very much like our modern engagement ceremony. Uh, in our modern engagement ceremony, the young couple would have the ceremony to announce to their families and their friends that, hey, we are getting married in the near future. Okay, It is quite the same in the ancient Jewish time, but with a twist, okay, with a twist, because their marriage is an arranged marriage. 
So, what happened is that, what happened is that when a boy likes a girl, he will ask his father to approach the girl's father to arrange, uh, to make the marriage proposal. And then if the father take a look and like the girl, the father will approach the girl's father. They will sit down, have a talk. They will size up one another, each other's families, uh, wealth, whatever you have, integrity and everything. And then they will come to a decision. If they agree to go ahead, the boy's father will have to pay a dowry, a dowry to the, bride, to the girl's family. Okay, to seal the marriage proposal, to seal the marriage contract. However, the wedding will not take place immediately. It usually takes place only one year or so later. Okay, you understand this? You understand some parables. Otherwise, you, you, you read some of the parables, you're wondering why, you know, the wedding date is fixed and yet people say, I cannot come. It's because there are two, phase, two phases to the uh, to, to the ancient Jewish wedding. So, okay, so you take one, takes, the wedding will happen one year later, right? So in the meantime, what did the bride and groom do? The groom will go back to the father's house and then build a room for his matrimonial home in the future. Okay, build a room. And this is usually an extension from the father's house. They are relatively, generally, people are quite poor. Okay, they'll build an extension from the father's house. As they marry young, as they marry young, the father will foot all the bills and make all the arrangements. So young people, you want to marry, marry, marry young, your parents will foot all the bills. <laughs> uh, don't tell your parents that your pastor say that. The boy doesn't know exactly when he's going to have the wedding. Why? The, date, the date is not fixed. So he doesn't know. The father decides. The one that controls the purse string decides. Okay, not enough money, build a little bit. After that, pause for one, two months, raise some money, then build again. So the father will decide when the time is right and the matrimonial room is ready. The father will then say, son, you may now go and take your bride home. And that is when the wedding date will be fixed. And then the son, on the wedding day, the son will go and Take the bride home. And the wedding feast will last for seven days. Of course, for the poor, the days are shorter. But generally, it is prescribed for seven days. Now, we see Jesus following this pattern in his dealing with his church, in his dealing with his disciples. On the night before his crucifixion, Jesus said to his disciples in John 14, 1-3, a familiar verse, but I bet many of you don't see it this way before. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back again and will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. Can you see that Jesus is using, using the ancient Jewish wedding imagery and language? In my father's house, there are many rooms. I go to prepare a place for you. Then I will come back to take you to myself. And where I am, you may be also. Now, Bible biblical scholars agree Okay, very few disagree. In general, all biblical scholars agree that Jesus is talking about the rapture in this passage. He will come back again to take his bride. He will come back again to take his church to be with him. The Father's house is in heaven. The Father's house is in heaven. That's where we will be with Jesus after our rapture. The two stages of the Jewish wedding are replicated in Jesus' first coming and will be replicated in Jesus' return to take his bride. In his first coming, Jesus promised his bride salvation. In his first coming, Jesus promised his bride eternal life. And he sealed the promise by giving the church 
His Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is a promise that I will come back to take you to be with me. And that's found in Ephesians chapter 1. Okay, the Holy Spirit is a seal of God's promise, of Jesus' promise that He will certainly come back to take you and I, to take His church, to take all His disciples to be with Him to heaven. Notice what Matthew says in 24, chapter 24 and 36. But concerning that day and hour, no one knows. Remember, the Son doesn't know. Only the Father knows because the Father decides. But concerning that day and hour, no one knows. Not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. So you realize that Jesus is using the ancient Jewish marriage imagery and language. Though the timing is not certain, Jesus' return is a certainty. Jesus will certainly come back to rapture his church. So, the million dollar question is, when will Jesus return? When will the rapture take place? Unfortunately, there's no clue given in this John 14 passage. But let me say this, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense if the rapture happens midway and at the end of the tribulation. Okay, you see, Jesus was comforting his disciples. Remember, he was comforting his disciples because he was going to the cross. He was going away. So he was comforting his disciples. That's the background. He was comforting his disciples in this passage. So how can he be a comfort to the church if the church has to go through the tribulation? It'll be no comfort at all. Okay? And by the way, there's no way to treat the bride. I go back to this imagery. Huh? There's no way to treat the bride. Okay, imagine Jesus saying to the imagine Jesus saying to his bride, now that we are betrothed, I will come back for you. But not until you have gone through three and a half or seven years experiencing the pleasure of my father's wrath. It doesn't make any sense. Context is very, very important. I mean, would you want to marry somebody that says that, hey, I promise you, uh, I will take care of you for the rest of my life, but before I come, uh, you are going to jalat jalat from my father and my mother. Okay, but granted, many of you will say, hey, Pastor, you know, you are reading into it. But yes, I'm reading into it, but it makes common sense. So that's not comforting at all. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't sound right. Now, I want to push this whole thing even deeper, take you deeper into the understanding. I don't want to leave you hanging halfway. So now I want to cross-reference this John 14 passage with a passage in Isaiah in the Old Testament, also using the ancient Jewish wedding context or rather imagery and language that depict the rapture. Okay, Some of you will be surprised to learn that the Old Testament also talk about the rapture. It does, but in a cryptic manner. Okay, so let's take a look at Isaiah 26. Chapter 26, this is a chapter where you get the name of our church, Rock of Ages. Okay, it may come in different form, the eternal rock, you know, the everlasting rock and all that. But Isaiah 26, verses 19 to 21. I'm going to read portion by portion and then explain to you. Your dead shall live. Their bodies shall rise. You who dwell in the dust, awake and sing for joy. For your dew is a dew of light, and the earth will give birth to the dead. Clearly, this is a reference to the rapture. This is about the resurrection of the dead. The language is similar to Paul's description in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 16, which we read earlier. And then if you look at verse 20, Come, my people, enter your chambers. Come, my people, enter your chambers. Now, here, Isaiah is using the ancient Jewish wedding imagery and language, which happens all the time with the prophets. The chambers refers to what? 
the bridal chambers. The chambers refer to the rooms that Christ has prepared for his bride. These are the rooms in the heavenly places. And this is the same language employed by John in John 14. And so after the rapture, the saints will be taken to the chambers. After the rapture, the saints will be taken to the room prepared for the bride, prepared for us who believe in Jesus Christ. And then the description that follows gets more exciting. Okay, in the second part of verse 20, and shut your door behind you. Hide yourself for a little while until the fury pass by. So the raptured saints is now, are now instructed to close the door, shut the door behind them, shut the door of the wedding chamber behind them and hide. And hide from the fury until the fury pass by. What fury? This is the wrath of God. This is the judgment of God. The saints are to hide themselves until the tribulation has ended. This is referring to the church taking shelter in the heaven as the tribulation is ongoing. The church is sheltered in heaven. And the next verse makes it even clearer. Verse 21 for behold, the Lord is coming out from His place. From where? From heaven. Okay? From His wedding with the church. The Lord is coming out from His place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity, for their sin. And the earth will disclose the blood shed on it and will no more cover its stain. Now, while the saints are secure in heaven, God will then come out to punish the inhabitants, the unrepentant inhabitants of the earth. And this feeds into the description of the tribulation, where God unleashes his wrath, where God judges, will judge the earth. Everything fits in very, very nicely. Now let me summarize this Isaiah passage that we have just gone through. First, the rapture will happen, the dead in Christ will rise. It didn't mention about those who are still alive, but Paul talked about that in 1 Thessalonians 4.17, that following the dead in Christ rising, those who are alive will also rise. After that, Jesus will then take the bride that is now raptured in, in, into the clouds, take them and bring the bride to his father's house, where there are many rooms many bridal chambers. So again, it is similar to John 14 description. And what happened after that is this. The tribulation will begin down on the earth. God will come out, Jesus will come out and begin to judge the earth. God will unleash his wrath and his judgment on the inhabitants of the earth. So you see, the church does not go through the tribulation. The saints are raptured and taken to heaven and hidden there. The tribulation begins on earth. This is a beautiful picture of God sheltering his church from the tribulation. And so this is the second reason why I believe in a pre-tribulation rapture position. We're coming to an end soon. Why do I believe in the pre-tribulation rapture? The third reason, God promises to keep faithful believers from the tribulation. God promises to keep faithful believers from the tribulation. In the book of Revelation, we read about Jesus writing, to seven, writing seven letters to seven churches. Uh, in the Asia Minor, where modern Turkey is, in these letters, Jesus commended the individual churches for their good deeds and reprimanded them and warned them to repent concerning their bad deeds. So here, let me give you some examples of the warnings given to the five churches. Losing their first love. Losing their first love. Now these Christians no longer have a living 
an ongoing relationship with Jesus Christ. Christianity to them is merely a religion. And then the second accusation or the second warning is dead faith. Their faith is dead. Okay, the third one is compromises. These Christians have a semblance of spirituality and piety. They know how to say all the right things when they come for service on Sunday. They meet in the, in the CGs and they can say all the right things, all the nice things. But in, inside them, inwardly, spiritually speaking, their spiritual condition is pathetic. And then you have sinful practices and lifestyles. And finally, you have lukewarmness. These Christians are lukewarm in their faith. They are blind and indifferent to the things of God. Outwardly, they appear to be spiritual, but inwardly, they really don't bother too much about the things of God. Now, Jesus warned all these unfaithful believers to repent. And if they didn't, and to get their act together, and if they didn't do that, they risk losing eternal rewards. And worse, they risk losing their salvation. So there are serious implications, there are serious consequences. Now, only two churches re receive praises and no warning at all. And these are the churches in Smyrna and in Philadelphia. To the church in Philadelphia, Jesus said this, give them this wonderful promise. Revelation 3.10 Because you have kept my word about patient endurance. Should be better read as because you have kept my words, my word with patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. The context of the hour of trial that is coming upon the whole world is the book of Revelation. So what is that context? I mean, the bulk of the book of Revelation is about the tribulation. So the context is the tribulation. The hour of trial that will come upon the entire world is the tribulation. And therefore, if you read this carefully, you realize that this is an allusion to the rapture. Faithful believers will be caught up to be with the Lord before the tribulation begins. Faithful believers will be caught up to be with the Lord before the hour of trial begins. And this is the third and final reason that I'm giving you today as to why I believe in the pre-tribulation rapture. I've run out of time for today. In today's sermon, I've given you three reasons why I believe in pre-tribulation rapture. Uh, today, I'm merely scratching the surface. I'm going to give you another four more reasons in my next sermons, in my next sermon. And I have to warn you first, it's going to be heavy going because these reasons are heavily loaded. Uh, uh, and I, but I have to take you deep into this thing so that you can be doubly sure about this position and why the pre-tribulation rapture position is the most biblically logical and coherent view. So I hope you have been blessed by today's sermon. I invite everyone to stand to your feet as I pray for you.